Yes, my name is Dietrich. Um, um, I'm a managing director of Kala Software company based here in Germany, so it was pretty close for me to get into here today. I'm also vice chair of um, the PDF Association and uh, in the PDF Association I am also um, the liaison A representative that represents the PDF Association at ISO. And for maybe for that reason, I um, wanted to give an introduction into um, PDF-based ISO standards in this session. So maybe just a few words um, uh, about the, the companies um, involved here. So I will introduce you into ISO just in a minute. And PDF Association, as maybe all of you know, um, PDF Association wants to market PDF and PDF-based ISO standards to the in for the industry and also want to uh, feed feedback from the market back into ISO. So PDF Association has two uh, ways of working, the ones towards the market, doing marketing about PDF and PDF-based ISO standards, and also uh, getting information from you and bringing that uh, into ISO. Color Software, the company that I'm working for when I'm not working for the PDF Association, uh, we are doing PDF software here in Berlin for 21 years now. Um, our first tool was Preflight, uh, a tool for the print and publishing industry that is now also part of Adobe Acrobat. Um, uh, and today we serve uh, the print and publishing market still, but also the document processes, specifically when it comes to, to archiving of PDF files. Most of our revenue is coming from OEM customers uh, integrating our solutions. And um, we are also very active at ISO, so I'm, I'm working in ISO TC130, which is, uh, amongst other things, PDF for graphic arts and TC171, and that is about um, document processes based on PDF. This is an overview. Um, who of, all of you knows all these um, PDF-based standards? So um, that is good, so I, I want to change that. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a couple of stuff we want to talk, so let's move on. So first, why, why actually would I want to use a, a PDF-based ISO standard? So why, why not just use PDF? So we have heard this morning how powerful PDF is and how, how ubiquitous it is as of today. So why not just use PDF for, for each and every purpose? So first, PDF is quite powerful. So the specification alone, the specification for the PDF file format is almost 1,000 pages. But in fact, that is just uh, the skeleton of the whole thing. Uh, in fact, it also has lots of references. So whenever possible, PDF hasn't invented stuff new, it, it references other specifications like for fonts, the Unicode specification, ICC profiles and so forth. And then we have, I don't know, maybe thousands or maybe just hundreds, but we have many, many PDF creators. So many, many applications on, on the earth create PDF files and then not each and every PDF file is the same, of course. So you, there are various ways in order to, to um, uh, create a PDF file that is, so PDF files may internally be completely different while seemingly the creating the very same appearance. So PDF files are not the same. And then also, of course, there are really, really correct PDF files, and then there are more, many, many more PDF files that are not fully correct and you only find that out when you want to use a PDF file seriously. And seriously meaning uh, 
maybe not just for, for creating the appearance of the PDF file on screen, maybe you want to print it on an offset printing machine or a digital printing machine, or you want to put it into the archive. So there are many, many purposes for PDF files. And then if you want to be really sure that a PDF file works for your very uh, purpose, then that is where um, PDF standards come into play. So, and that is basically what, what PDF standards want to achieve. So they want to provide clear and simple rules. So all of these standards are pretty technical. Uh, and what they want to achieve is interoperability between organizations and processes that use PDF. Um, so it's quality assurance, uh, it's a reliable technical foundation. And then also, um, if you have a standard and something doesn't work as expected, you have a means to find out who is the culprit. So he, who has actually done something wrong. So a PDF file has been printed, but it, the, the, the advertiser who has uh, submitted it to the printer complains after the PDF file has been printed because the appearance is not as intended, then you can look into the PDF file and find out whether the creator of the PDF file made something wrong or the printer. And then you can use PDFX. So if they agree to use PDFX, you should find rules in PDFX for the printing industry who um, made something wrong. I also thought, okay, maybe just briefly, I want to introduce you how ISO actually works in order to create uh, standards. It's a, it's a very formal procedure. Um, you have committees, and I've already mentioned two of them, the one for graphics arts and the one for document processes. Both are working with uh, and for PDF. Uh, and these committees are divided into working groups, and working groups are divided into task forces. And the task forces and the working groups are then working on projects, and the project is a standard or a technical specification or whatever, but in many cases it's standards. And any document that is created uh, underwent um, stages. Um, so you start with a working draft, then as a committee draft, then a draft international standard, then it should be already pretty final, and then a final uh, stage is the FDIS, which is the final draft international standard. And in order to get from one stage to the other, uh, you, you have votings. So all national standardization bodies here in Germany, it's a DEAN. So most of the nations have uh, standardization bodies. And these are members at ISO. And the DEAN for Germany, or I don't know, ANSI for America, has each country just one vote, uh, uh, a vote to uh, say you want to, you agree to the standard, you agree, but you have comments, or you don't agree, or you abstain. So this is how it works. Um, PDF Association has a role here as kind of an expert. So you can use everybody of you, or every member of the PDF Association has the right to submit comments into ISO um, and to have access to all the documents that are created, but the PDF Association doesn't have a vote here. So this is uh, the, the, the only difference uh, that you have if you want to uh, um, be part of the standardization. Every member of the PDF Association can do so, but you don't have a vote in these formal votings. Okay, and then you have many more requirements. So in fact, you have hundreds of pages about how this procedures actually work. So there are many more rules, but these are the thing that I believe makes sense to know about how these standards are being created. Um, uh, if you have any questions, just at any time, let me know. I mean, um, I hope it's clear enough, but if not, uh, I don't know, you want to add something, just just do so whenever you want. So, ah, Dorf. One quick thing, you mentioned that members of the PDF Association have access to the standards only before they become actually uh, 
yeah. promulgated as standards. After that, you're like everyone else, you have to pay for your copy. Exactly. So, so, so do, I, do I. So I'm, I'm an expert there, so I'm attending all the meetings, but the business model of ISO is so um, uh, that um, uh, uh, submitting stuff into the committees, everybody, or many, many people can do, um, but um, they, they make money by selling standards. So uh, also every expert provides information to ISO for free, but ISO need to make money in order to um, uh, finance their organization and the submit submission of staff and so forth, and that is uh, um, coming from selling standards. Good point. Anyway, so we have quite uh, a few standards to cover. So the first one obviously is PDF 2.0, and I, I, I want to make this rather short because I believe we, we, we can hear a lot many stuff during these two days and otherwise about PDF. So maybe just briefly, it has been developed uh, in, within 10 years, and it was uh, the really the the the, the first. Uh, instance of the PDF specification. So we have heard in the in this morning that it all started with PDF 1.0 and uh, it was developed at Adobe and at a certain point it was delivered to ISO from Adobe and uh, then it was published at ISO 32000-1. Um, but that was pretty much the same as PDF 0.7 uh, that has been published by Adobe beforehand. And this second instance of the PDF 32000 is now uh, more or less completely rewritten, uh, at least reword. Many, many chapters are completely rewritten. Uh, the, the major USPs of PDF haven't changed. And what's now happening at ISO is PDF 2.0 is a new foundation that is planned to also become the foundation of ISO-based um, PDF standards, PDF-based ISO standards, rather. So, so far about PDF 2.0. And then we already have heard that, so I'm, uh, I'm happy that um, Richard already covered um, and, and Stefan about PDFX, so we can be short here. Um, that was the oldest standard. I have a graphic arts background too, so for me it was also um, very important when in my professional career with, with PDF, um, and that was about exchange of PDF files for the print and prepress industry. Um, yeah, it's of course closely related to other ISO standards for the print uh, print market. It is rather widely used uh, in the printing industry, so at least everybody knows about PDFX. Stefan mentioned that not everybody is using the latest versions here, but it, it is uh, very widely used. There are um, complaints from the industry that it's too broad because PDFX in just one standard covers the whole industry. So there's just one standard for offset printing, flexible printing, digital printing, screen printing, whatever. And the requirements actually are very different. So you can't, a PDF that is created for an offset printing machine can't be really used on a, a screen printing machine, for instance. So, and then there are specialized groups like the PDF uh, Gantt Workgroup and uh, PDF X Ready, and these groups build standards on the, on the PDF X foundation with specifications then for the, uh, var uh, for the various uh, printing industries. Yeah, we've heard that. There is PDF X1A that came out in 2001. It was uh, the first PDF-based ISO standard, and that was basically just uh, the print color space CMYK. Does this work? Yeah, there. And then PDF X3 came out slightly thereafter, and uh, the, the main differences here are in red. PDF X3 opposed to PDF X1A has one major difference. It supports device in independent colors with uh, ICC-based colors. And then PDF X4 came out 
eight years later, so quite a while uh, in between. And the new thing here uh, was that transparency and layers are permitted. So PDF X1A and PDF X3 didn't support transparency, but that what became possible with PDF X4. So and because um, this is always an, an issue, I want to dig a little deeper into the pre transparency topic. Um, and I want to do that by using an example. Um, so in the graphic arts industry, designers, when Adobe came out with transparency in their imaging model in, um, by beginning of this uh, thousand years, millennium, um, designers soon took up on that and used transparency everywhere. And this was an, in Germany, a German advertisement that became kind of famous because it created so many problems on the printing machines um, or in the, in the RIP devices. Um, and um, for the ones who are not that much interest, interested in PDFX, the same topic actually also applies to when, it, when you discuss whether you would want to use PDF A1 a, uh, a PDF A1 or PDF A2. So what, what is the problem here? If you look into the file, so you have various uh, instances of this uh, uh, smiley or whatever that is there. And if you look there, if you, if you zoom in further, you can see this created of many, many objects. So you have in fact, thousands of objects, and each of the objects uh, interacts with the other objects by mean of means of transparency. So you have a smooth shade here, and all these objects are, are laying uh, in, in the Z order uh, above each other, and each of them lets uh, the background uh, color shine through. And that means if you want to get rid of this transparency here, you have to create new images. So you have to kind of calcul calculate the color appearance and make out of these thousands objects, you have to create new objects with the combined colors. And transparency flattening takes place in a way that it would for each and every place where you have such uh, interaction between colors, it would create a new image. Um, and, and you have to do that in order to don't uh, get into problems with the resolution. So of course you could create a, an image from the whole page, but then you would have resolution problems. So you, would, you, you need to create new objects for each of these uh, uh, locations. And then for this example, that means you would blow up the file size uh, 10 times, and you would have afterwards uh, five times as many objects. And in addition to that, um, you create many more problems. So um, of course, this, this more complex file is more difficult to process. But um, for instance, if you would have text, that would be transparent, and this would uh, be flattened into an image. You would get rid of the ability to uh, uh, copy the text out of the PDF file because the text has been converted into an image. Uh, the tagging structure for the, the, in, uh, the invisible structure in a PDF file that is used for, for accessibility, for instance, usually gets invalidated when you flatten uh, a file to get rid of transparency. And this, for the printing industry, it's important. Uh, you have changes in the color space, and that make it um, impossible to lose to, after a transparency flattening has taken place, for instance, convert spot colors to CMYK. So you, you introduce many, many problems uh, when you need to convert transparency, uh, when you need to flatten transparency. The term for processing uh, real transparency, so, so you don't flatten the transparency or you only flatten it in the rip when you, when you create the actual print of it, uh, is uh, you say you, you can process live transparency. And that is, the, the, I think Stefan said he's, he was kind of 
complaining that the industry doesn't take up on PDF X4. I mean, uh, he said 40 percent, I, I, as far as I remember. Uh, and then that is the main reason here. So the main reason why actually we uh, want the industry to, to use PDF X4 is that then you can uh, use live transparency. And in fact, the, all the output devices as of today, they can deal with, with real transparency. So you actually don't need to flatten files. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to say on that. And I want to, to again say that the very same reason is uh, the reason why we also say it would be better if people, instead of using PDF A1, would use PDF A2. I mean, I think there we have a similar situation. So there, there isn't much of an uptake on PDF A2 in the markets, but actually, whenever you have transparency, it would be much better. Anyway, as I've said before, um, uh, ICE was working on PDF X6. That is not going to be a revolution. It will rather be uh, further developed, very similar to PDF X4, but based on PDF 2.0, and then you have some uh, additional information there uh, that you can use just by, base, uh, ba uh, by basing PDF X6 on PDF 2.0. So there are page-based output intents, black point compensation, uh, screening information, halftone origin, and CXF. And because CXF is another ISO standard, I also briefly want to, s to mention that one. CXF is spectral data. So as you may imagine, the print industry is quite picky about colors. And especially are the big advertisers, they are quite picky about their company colors. So uh, uh, Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola red. So if, if, it, if it's not really the Coca-Cola red, Coca-Cola can create many, many problems for a printer. So, um, and then on the other hand, the printing devices are really evolving. So as of today, you print on uh, uh, wrappings on, on, on uh, houses and you, you print on transparent foils, you print on metal and whatever. So the, the printing machines and the printing procedures are really evolving. So and now, of course, it makes it, it gets e much more complicated today to make sure that the Coca-Cola red or the Pepsi, let's name the other one as well, uh, blue looks the same on each on and every substrate. So the only thing that you can do as of today is you at least um, uh, copy color information into the PDF file. And you can do that by means of CXF. Uh, and that will go into PDFX with PDFX6 uh, by incorporating spectral measurements of this blue and this red and whatever and copy that information into the PDF file. And that is CXF. So far, the print and publishing marked. Moving on to PDFA. PDFA, I guess all of you know what PDFA is. It's for archival. PDFA 1 came out in 2005. Um, yeah, and it started with replacing TIFF in archives. And as of today, we have, in, in many cases, uh, it, uh, it, it didn't start. It doesn't start with paper, so you don't scan the file. You just uh, a file that has originally been created with Word or any uh, apl application and convert that to. Uh, PDFA. So in comparison to PFX, we now have something that is not intended to go to paper. So that, that may never have seen actually paper, a PDF file that has been created in Word, then converted to PDFA and put into the archive. Uh, so we are much more in a digital, digital world here compared to PDFX, where the final destination of the PDF file actually is paper. Yeah, it works with digital signatures. It's, I mean, it's used all over the world, but it's much more used here in, in, in Europe. 
and some organizations uh, don't just use it for archival. They also they understand that PDFA is more reliable than regular PDF, so it's also used for interchange and um, interoperability. Yeah, briefly, I mean, I think that might not be you, new to many of them. Uh, some requirements, colors, fonts need to be embedded, colors need to be, colors need to be device independent. As I've said, transparency uh, is only allowed in PDF-A2 and PDF-A1. It would have to be transparency flattened. The same for layers only allowed in PDF-A2. Um, yeah, and then we have the conformance levels. So B is uh, the basis, 99% of the files as of today are conformance level B. You have A, which uh, requires tagging structure and Unicode, and then you have uh, for uh, with PDF A2, ISO introduced also um, uh, a sub or something in between P uh, conformance level A and B, which is conformance level Unicode. And Unicode is a good thing. If you have Unicode for your text, uh, you can do text search, you can uh, a search for a string in a PDF file, um, you can, and you can copy text out of the PDF file. Because it's, uh, I think, a special case quite distinct to PDF-A1 and PDF-A2, I want to specifically mention PDF-A3, which came out just one year after PDF-A2 has been published. Uh, and since we are talking ISO here, uh, that was possible only in the procedures, if you remember, of ISO, it, it only was possible to do that just within one year, was because uh, almost all text of PDF A3 remain unchanged to PDF A2. So 90% of the text is the same. The only difference is PDF A3 allows for arbitrary uh, content, arbitrary file formats to be embedded. So in PDF A2, you could have embedded files, but only if they also comply to PDF A. Uh, yep, yeah, to PDF A. So and these are, many people didn't understand that in the first place because they say, okay, you, you explained to me I need to do PDF A because it's more reliable and it's a, it's a standardized archive format. And now you say, okay, but now you can embed just everything into PDF A3. So how, 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 that can, how can that make sense? And yeah, I think the question is, is uh, valid. Um, the thing is, you have certain use cases, so here, it, it, it really doesn't make sense, in my opinion, to just make it possible to embed each and every file into, a, in, into an archive, so it doesn't make sense. But in certain limited use cases, as for hybrid invoices, where you have an XM, XML structure combined with uh, the PDF invoice, there it very well makes sense, or if you have a source file, embedded to your PDF file, then, then it also makes sense. Or if you have a digital dossiers, with dossier with various components, it very well makes sense. So this is PDF A3. And then again, similar to PDF X6, um, ISO is working on PDF A4. And this is maybe for the ones of you who are mostly interested in PDF A. Just a preview on that. Uh, it, it won't be published before next year. Um, it will be based on PDF 2.0. Um, and maybe the most important thing here is uh, this is the structure that is currently planned. So there will be a major PDF A compliance. And that is basically the same as uh, I should have said PDF A to B here. So that is similar to what we know today use in the conformance level B. Um, then there will be 
uh, conformance level F, and that will be the successor of PDF A3. So there it will be possible to embed arbitrary file formats into the PDF A container. And then um, PDF E, which is yet another PDF-based ISO standard, and the E stands for engineering. And these, this committee basically has said that uh, the industry is more interested instead of having another uh, standard part of PDF-E, they want to make this become part of PDF-A. So, and the ISO committee more or less uh, stopped working on PDF-E, so they began with it and all the work is now being transferred into PDF-A4. Clear? So then we can skip this slide. That was about uh, PDF-E. Um, there is uh, not much practical use. So um, industry does actually use PDF-A3. So the German car manufacturing industry has uh, created a standard. And instead of building the standard based on PDF-E, they build it on PDF-A3. So the, the, the requirement for doing so was, was coming from the industry and it, it, it works very well in, in PDF-A. So in fact, PDF-A4E has many similarities to um, PDF-4F because uh, um, PDF-E and PDF-F allow for uh, other file formats being embedded into PDF-A container. So these are, I believe, the most important standards that uh, we have in the market, PDF-X and PDF-E. And now um, we are at rather specializing standards. PDF-VT is a variable and transactional printing. Um, it's an ex exchange format for what, what is also called uh, customer communication, communication management or output management. Um, a PDF, typical PDF VT file, VT1 file at least, has thousands of pages and each of or groups of pages representing, for instance, invoices or other mass communication um, uh, stuff. The difference between PDF VT1 and VT2 is uh, the one difference is PT, PDF VT1 is complete, while PDF VT, VT2 might be a, a template and the uh, variable content is coming from other PDF like uh, file formats. So you have just one PDF V2 template and then zillions of uh, uh, PDF-like objects with the concrete uh, and the actual invoice data, for instance. The other difference between VDF, PDF VT1 and 2 is that PDF VT1 is at least somewhere used, while PDF VT2, in fact, is not. Um, yeah, nevertheless, both address actually uh, uh, an increasing demand in the print, print industry because uh, the print industry, one uh, trend there definitely is individualization and uh, yeah, getting, you, ha you can have your uh, cup with your name printed on it and so forth. So this is definitely something that is evolving. Um, and the advantage of PDF uh, for this market is when you compare it, what, what is there to used today, like AFP and PCL and so forth, uh, it has an, a, a wider uh, graphical model. What I think is, is one of the issues in, in PDF VT, at least, is uh, what, uh, of course, with PDF, it's always about interoperability. So you want to create the PDF file somewhere without having to discuss with your print shop or so uh, how, you, how you design your PDF file. Um, and then you want to have, if you have all these invoices, you want to have metadata. So you want to know which 
groups of pages belong to an invoice and then also maybe the zip code for the invoice so that you can, when you print it, uh, put it out in the right order so that your mail uh, service provider can submit it in the right order or you can submit it to the mail pro service provider in the right order. So you need to have metadata. Um, in order to uh, specify which pages are for which uh, zip code, for instance. Um, uh, PDFVT specifies uh, the syntax for such metadata, which is called dpart. So PDFVT defined dpart, and PDFVT, uh, this dpart is now also uh, specified in PDF 2.0 but it only defines sim syntax and not semantics. So it only says, okay, this is a structure that you can use, but it doesn't say in which way you would encode a zip code in that structure. And that, of course, is only halfway towards interoperability. And that leads me to another standard, uh, the, the print the print product metadata for PDF files, and that I'm going to mention later on. Then, of course, also here we have the same procedure again. So there will be PDF VT3, and that will be based on PDF X6, and that in turn will be based on PDF 2.0. Then we have PDF VCR, which is a variable content replacement. It's very similar to PDF VT, and just briefly, the difference here is uh, that the variable data is coming from a CSV file. So instead of uh, having other PDF files with the variable content here, you just, it's only possible to change text in the instances of the PDF file because all the variable data is just from CSV. The advantage here or the reason why uh, that has been specified. It's, it's about real-time applications where you read something on, for instance, a credit card. You read information out of the credit card and then get data out of a database in order to print the envelope for the credit card, for instance. Yes, please. Are there, or will be there some, some formatting rules, for example, for um, how you want to print the, the address, for example. No, you have a, you have kind of a, a, a placeholder in the PDF file, in the template file, and you, you specify uh, which data is variable by using tagging structure, uh, and then you, you just, instead of the text is there, you would use the formatting that is there for the, for the placeholder, and then you just exchange the text of the placeholder with the actual data. It, it effectively merges the equivalent of a, uh, uh, a comma-separated uh, file, a uh, CSV file, in, based on the names and the columns, into a template which is defined in PDF. Okay. Yeah. But, but no, 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 no formatting. Not, it's not PostScript again. We're not trying to do formatting on the fly. There's no form. We suggested, but we did recently decided not to. I mean. If, if you want to do that, then you, you would use PDF VT2. That basically, basically has all the formatting that you can have in, in PDF. Uh, this is specifically designed for high performance, real time print environments. And there you won't do formatting. PDF UA for universal accessibility um, came out 2014, um, four years ago. It's about accessibility, it's about the invisible tagging structure in a PDF file. Um, and it tends or it wants to address the issue that uh, it's not easy uh, to create a fully tagged accessible PDF file and by means of the standard, it's now clear how you can do that. Um, other than for HTML and ebook formats, it's, it, this is something that you need in addition to creating the PDF file. So also in HTML, it's not so that it's always and automatically accessible, but you're 
quite there where you need to be for accessibility. Th that is different for PDF. So you can have a PDF file that looks very, very nice on screen. Everything's just in, in place, but it's, there is no tagging structure at all. Uh, and that means there is no means to, to use this in an accessible fashion. Um, so, and that is uh, where PDF UA comes into play. It has been designed to uh, be, I mean, all these ISO standards uh, share, for instance, and in, at least in the next uh, version, they will share lots of text. So whenever, uh, in these days, when we at ISO develop something for PDF A4, uh, we uh, always think, okay, can we use the very same provision in PDF X6? And if, if so, uh, we use the same text there. So that means all of these standards can be combined with each other. So, so you can easily, I mean, maybe not easily, but you can have a PDF file that is complies to PDF UA, to X, to A at the, at the same time. Okay, and then tagging is not just important because it has structure, it's not just important for accessibility, it is also important if you want to repurpose the content of the PDF file. So if you want to have uh, 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 automatic uh, line breaks adjusted to the size of your screen or whatever, whenever you want to do something that uh, just not displays the content on screen, um, tagging structure is quite helpful. Um, yeah, technical basis, PDF A to you. Um, yeah, I think um, I have pretty much covered that. Um, so that's uh, all the standards that are re around as of today. And the rest we really do very briefly. Um, just a few more standards. Processing steps also for printing industry, for packaging, uh, that has uh, additional information in PDF file, like for white or varnish or cut line. We will have a session on that uh, tomorrow afternoon. Um, PDF R, that might be important for you as well. There is a standard as of today, which is called PDF Raster, uh, that can uh, be uh, downloaded from PDF Association website. It has been de developed together with Twain, uh, the work group that um, uh, works for a standardization of the communication between scanner devices and applications. Um, and they also want to replace TIFF there. Uh, as the exchange format between scanner devices and applications. They want to do so because in PDF file you have by nature multiple pages, you have better compression and you have widely available viewers. Um, of course, it, or it, it, it strongly limits PDF features to make sure that all the, the bandwidth uh, of the communication between the scanner and the workflow or the application uh, doesn't need to be much higher as of today. And this PDF raster standard has uh, just recently been submitted to ISO uh, for a fast, fast uh, process uh, and the plan is to publish this as PDF AR in maybe next year. Finally, there is an, a standard that I think is important for variable and transactional printing, which is print product metadata, and that overcomes the issue that I previously mentioned with this metadata that is defined in PDF VT, this D part structure, but this standard now defines what fields you, you should use for what purposes uh, when it comes to um, uh, page-based metadata. So, and, and we will cover this standard in more detail in the same session that also talks about processing steps. So, <coughs> One step back again, so this is the overview about all PDF-based ISO standards up until here as of today and uh, three more upcoming. Um, looking at it, I think it's, it really started with something as a preprint 
pre-product for print and then we went to a digital archives where the final destination of the PDF file isn't the print or the paper anymore. It's just about digital documents. And from then on, we have just various uh, workflows that use PDF files as their main means to, to transport the actual information that needs to be processed as the at the receiving site. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes. I mean, I, I, I'm starting here with PDF 1.7, so you could, you, you, you definitely have PDF 1.3 compliant files, and actually there is no reason why n for not doing so. Though none of these standards has uh, deprecated something, and so far as uh, it would invalidate an old PDF file. Uh, but um, unfortunately, there are also PDF files around that aren't really PDF files and because they are not fully compliant with the specification. Okay. But, but I mean, the, the, the base standards PDF 1.7 and PDF 2.0 are gray here. I mean, the, the majority of PDF files doesn't comply to any of the other standards. And, and can you compare, let's say, PDF 1.3? Something different or no, 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 no. Okay, maybe that that uh, all of these standards, each of these uh, PDF-based ISO standards, is based on a certain version of the PDF specification. The subsets, so the subset standards. That's what's important to understand. Okay. So they 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 um, limit the features that you can use in PDF to a certain uh, application. So. Okay. I mean, any other questions? Yes, please. Sorry, it's maybe a very basic question. I do apologize. But since this is a marketing stream, we seem to have gone down the route of having multiple different versions of the standards. Standards are great, let's have lots of them. But to me, that is a recipe for confusion. Do we think that going forward, multiple different standards is good? Or should we be looking to recombine them back into a single standard that we can quote is the gold standard with all of these, all of these different yeah, it's a good it's a good question, definitely. I mean, the 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 problem with that is then, of course, you would have a very high level. So, uh, someone who wanted to create a PDF file that it complies to all of the rules, it's pretty tough to do so. And then you also have uh, contradictory requirements. So, for PDF A, you want a small file that is as small as possible. While for PDF X and print, you would want a PDF a file that is as complete as possible. So there are there are details that are contradicting each other. What we at ISO want to do is we want to merge that. And so far as whenever I mean, for instance, the whole font section that is about embedding fonts is will be the same in PDF X six as it is in PDF A. So um, on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the basis of the real provisions, they, the standards will really become very similar. And only where you have contradictory or varying requirements or additional requirements for a certain industry, then they will be different. But I, I, I fully agree. I mean, I've, just for the PDFA industry, this is confusing to people. You have PDFA 1, you have PDFA 2, you have PDFA 3. And there, in fact, there were discussions. Do we really want to do PDFA 4? But then ISO said, or we at ISO said, yeah, but we, we can't ignore PDF 2.0. So now that we have the new PDF standard, PDF 2.0, uh, we need to have a PDFA standard that is built on that. Yes, please. Um, maybe you. If I'm, I'm working for the government and we have to do with all kinds of regulations, especially now the accessibility regulation and also uh, uh, requirements for archiving. So we are re recommending within the Dutch government PDF 
EUA, yeah. but also PDFA, and well, all our customers, all our uh, fellow uh, civil service, which side we should have? Which, how do we combine these two? Let you make two types of every thing we will publish? We need a gold standard. Yeah, I mean, for PDF UA and PDF A, that is actually, they're pretty close. So it shouldn't be a, technically a big problem to um, uh, create a file that complies to both. Um, but maybe that is something that we as PDF Association can do um, to uh, develop some information about how that actually can be done. So, I really that this yeah, I think it's. Yeah. Organizations. Oh, it's not really yeah, it's too bad that Duff is not here. Um, yeah. So, I, but I, I will take it. Take it with me. That that is a good point. Yeah. Duff. You know, as a vendor, I'm from Adobe. Uh, we're seeing strong requests for essentially documents out of uh, capable out of uh, programs such as InDesign to conform to both PDF X and to PDF A. Okay. In other words. It is reliable for printing, but it also meets the needs for archiving. I think you can reasonably safely assume, this is not a product announcement, uh, since this is Mark, said it's Mark, um, <laughs> that in the future you will see options to basically, as we get into PDF 2.0 based standards, to let's say have PDF X6 and a PDF A for whatever, uh, at the set simultaneously. And as PDF UA2 becomes a little bit better defined and s becomes a standard, then maybe even doing that. Uh, there are certain things where for PDF X, if it, there's certain features you want, it really precludes PDF A and vice versa. So, but the, for a large number of the documents out there, for example, a PDF file coming out of these presentations, for example, there's no reason why, unless you put animations or JavaScript or something weird like that in it, that it can't be both fully printable and fully archivable and fully accessible. So you're absolutely right. We're moving towards that direction. The people who are involved in the committees actually are making sure that the language is in common on these things. So that makes it will make it a lot easier. And we'll, as the software provider, will make it easier to basically say a document complies with this, this, and this, if you want it. I mean, just, you're, um, just, I mean, you, if you were in the session, you can very well say, okay, I forget, I'm, I'm forgetting right now everything of the session. Uh, what is important here is really it's PDFX for printing, is PDFA and maybe PDFUA. So these are really intended for broad markets. The others are more for special markets. No, you turn, you turn. So what I'm hearing is moving towards almost a PDF core with variations. Effectively, that's what it's going to look like. But by keeping these tags on it, a printer who's afraid that uh, something's going to ruin his printing press. The original PDF X1A, we're ready for this one, didn't allow annotations because they were afraid that a rip was going to find a movie embedded in the PDF file and that the printing press would start playing a movie. Okay. <laughs> I was dealing with Luddites at the time. You know, th th this is the type of mentality. So it, did, it prevented certain things. PDF X6 will allow movie annotations as long as you have a, a marquee that shows what that movie would look like if you see a printed version of that piece of paper. So there's, there was paranoia involved, there were special interests involved, and we are trying to bring it all together. <laughs> but it will maintain certain of these tags for confidence building, let's put it that way, and for situations where, yes, there are situations where I have a PDF A file and with certain things in it that really can't be a PDF X file and vice versa. In those cases, you'll only see the one thing. But in many cases, if not most, we can combine. That's the, the way we're moving. Okay, one more question. Uh, to add to that, and that's that as marketers, we're looking at benefits and goals. And it would be helpful to have a diagram of the sort of thousand page 
core and then say this is what PDF-A is, this is what PDF-UA is, <laughs> and where they, uh, they um, so the intersect because, the no, not all the features, basically, yeah. just to simplify it. Really. Just if one. If you look at the Dutch government, you say, we want to archive things, but we also want things to be accessible. Well, you have to use UA because then when somebody goes to the archive and they open something, it has to be accessible. Right, so we have to be more, more clear to the end users about the goals are versus the amount of the text. So the just one slack line per, per senate, you think, thinking about that, something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, the one thing you have to remember so when you talk about something like UA is you do have to look at, it's not just the, the freaking PDF file, but it's what you start with and the content as you create it. And that is represented in the PDF file. So that it's not just a matter of what we can do in making a PDF file, but what you do in creating and formatting the original content to be accessible. I'm, I'm happy to take more questions, and I will do, but um, I, I'm, I have to say that uh, we are 10 minutes in lunch, so... <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, basically, if there are no other questions... Um, one, one, one more. Just a short, just a short remark. Uh, regarding the PDF BT and PDF uh, BCR, uh, you still are showing that we, we met last year in Vienna. Yeah, I know. Uh, and uh, you still are showing that it's uh, in low with use, which is not true. Actually, uh, I, I'm representing the print industry, oh. and we are using the PDF BT really, really a lot. Uh, the problem with PDF BT and uh, PDF BCR is uh, that uh, the software that allows to create such files are garbage. Uh, I know that you will sh no, no, s put something on me, but uh, it's true. Uh, first of all, uh, let's say, for example, Heidelberg is a giant uh, in the print industry and uh, with, uh, with its uh, Brinex software, it's still not allowing to pre create PDF ET file with a uh, content that is uh, in Unicode. Uh, Canon and uh, other developers are, uh, are allowing to create PDF BT files only inside their uh, ecosystem. So you even don't know that uh, they are actually creating the PDF files, but they are just before the read. Uh, the other vendors are doing the same thing, that it's device dependent, let's say. Not, like that. not necessarily. Yes, Try XMPI. They have a product that's device independent. The samples that the PDF Association has posted on their website of PDF BT are device independent. They were done with InDesign, with the XMPI plugin. Yeah, sure. And, uh, I mean, that, that is really something that is, maybe it, it always takes some time. And um, I'm, we, we are seeing lots of movements in, in PDF BT area specifically. So that was one of the reasons why we started to, to develop PDF BT threads. So I see, I think, of course, it's always like the, the, the chicken and the egg thing. So you need the, the industry first. And uh, you're heavily using it. And I see changes here in Germany too in the com customer communication area and then of course that will that only creates demand for applications to become better in that area and, so and another, uh, another thing that another remark regarding the movies the print, uh, printers was uh, trying to print no I, that's not true the no. biggest issue was actually that uh, the uh, ripping software was ripping with uh, for example comments that was set in the file uh, by, by some of the users and uh, shouldn't be printed, but it was ripped and printed. Uh, so that was an issue, how it started. No. Uh, comments, anyway. Comments in, in a PDF file have never been restricted in any of the subsets. So anyway, right after lunch, um, we will reconvene here with a session on PDF statistics. Thank you very much for being here with me. Um, yeah, and uh, we'll see each other, I think, during these days.